Here we have a somewhat eh, contrived situation, but it's an example of a something that's fairly common. More importantly, the biggest thing about this question is it points out how we deal with static friction versus kinetic friction differently. You know this for part A, they specifically talk about the force that he must exert to get the block moving, so not moving at the time. So we know that we're using mu s, and in that sense, we have the frictional force is less than or equal to mu fn, magnitude speaking. Then for part B, it starts to move, so it's moving. So we have to use kinetic friction, which has an equal sign, mu k fn. These are all magnitude, of course, because they go in a completely separate direction. So that's a two situation, and you see that we get slightly different numbers because as you might know, static friction tends to be a little higher than kinetic friction. We're gonna use the same basic principles here, of course. We're gonna deal with sum of forces. It's equal to acceleration. And again, being vector quantity on the 2D problem, we'll break them down into X and Y, where I guess in this case, I'll call this positive X and call that positive Y. Drawing the free body diagram with the same axes in place, the block is on Earth, so it's subjected to the force of gravity straight downwards. It's also touching the ground, so the ground's gonna push up with a normal force away from itself. The direction of friction. Now, which way are we trying to move the body? We're trying to move it towards the right. So friction always opposes our motion and tries to push back to the left to stop us from moving at all. Then finally, we also have this uh, force from the hand, which is also touching the block. So, and then we're given that that's 25 degrees. So again, free body diagram, list out all the forces by considering everything that your body touches, as well as gravity. With this, we also have to consider my acceleration. And in this case, it's just starting to move. It's basically barely not moving. What that allows us to say is, a y is equal to zero, which of course it is, because it's not caving into the ground or flying into the air, but also a x is equal to zero. On top of that, because it's barely not moving, my static friction, we're at the biggest possible static friction. So instead of less than or equal to, we have an actual equal to sign, which allows us to actually use it to solve for things. Otherwise, the treatment will be very different. So with all that, we once again sum up forces in x and y. Starting with the x, that's max, which we know to be zero. And all the forces in that direction is we have, oh, let's put the uh, corner axes back on because I scrolled up too far. We have the force over here, which gets decomposed. So the x component of that is the cosine 25 in the positive direction, as we have defined it, minus ff because it pushes back the other way. And that's all the forces we have in the x, which gives us f cosine 25 minus mu s fn. Then we have to find out what fn is. This all equals to zero, so once we have fn, hopefully we can solve for f. To get fn, we of course have to look at the y direction, because that's the direction that fn is in. In this case, a y is zero, so we have zero. How many forces we got? We got the minus fg, which we all know is equal to m times g. And this time it goes straight down, so it coincides with our y-axis in this case, plus fn, which pushes upwards, which we're trying to find out. And also, there's a bit of a y component to the force from my hand. So downward is going to be sine 25 of the force that we're applying. Now, if we try to solve for fn, here's something that you should take note of is that because we're pushing not only the block forward, we're also pushing the block down, we're actually increasing the normal force and therefore increasing the friction. So pushing down and forward is really not the smartest way to push things, but sometimes depending on the way your body is standing, that may be necessary. So that's why the fn is not just mg, 
it's empty and whatever force you're squeezing on the floor with as well. So bear that in mind and don't just memorize that Fn is equal to mg because it's not true in many, many cases. The safest way to go is to always sum up your forces in x and y separately and then solve for what you need. Then you will never get tricked. Coming back to here, we take this whole thing and put that in there. So we have F cosine 25 degrees minus mu s Fg plus F sine 25 degrees is equal to zero. To solve for f, we have two terms of f in it, so mathematically a little more challenging, but not too bad. We just have to separate and distribute all these brackets and then collect all the terms with f's in it. Minus, because that goes in, is equal to zero. It's all just math now at this point. Putting anything that's not having f in it on the other side, so we have mu s fg, which we can rewrite as mu s mg. F factors out. And then we're left with a bit of a mess to enter in a calculator, but not so bad, given, you know, have the correct brackets and whatnot, of course. As given by the textbook, mu s is ice on ice, and it's 0 0.1, and we'll remember that it's 0 0.03 for later. But right now we want the mu s. The mass we're given. 45 kilogram g we have worked with quite a bit we're using 9.8 and then the rest is the same minus another mu s so 0 0.1 again putting that on the calculator you should get something along this line to give you 51.039 newtons and that's for part a For part B, we are now moving. So AX doesn't equal zero anymore. AX is what we're interested in, but we're told that the F is the same as last time. So given F, we can probably figure out AX. And because we're moving, FF is equal to mu K FN. And remembering from the table, we're using 0 0.03 as our mu k. Then we also know because the ground is pretty solid, the ay is equal to zero. Drawing the free body diagram again, we have fg going downwards, fn going upwards. Friction is still trying to stop our movement towards the right. And again, the applied force, which we can break into the y component and the x component individually. Keeping our definition for positive x and positive y, we can again sum up my forces. From last part, you might remember that it's probably more fruitful to do the y direction first because that's got the zero in it because that's my may. And so we have fy negative minus fg plus fn. This will help us solve for our fn, which hasn't changed from before, to be honest. This is, of course, f sine 25 degrees negative minus m times g plus fn. All this being equal to zero, we can put fn on the one side, getting everything else on the other side, and we have that. Then from that, we know that FF is equal to mu K FN. So we can sub all that in later. Looking in the X direction, we have MAX, which is not zero now, but we're maintaining the same force, but the kinetic friction is less than static friction. So it's quite typical that if you manage to maintain the same force, you will keep on accelerating once you start the motion moving. So all the forces with Fx minus Ff, that's all we have, which is F cosine 25 degrees minus mu K Fn, which is my Mg plus F sine 25 degrees. 
And in this case, we're not looking for f, we're looking for ax, so we divide everything by m. f we know from the last part, mu k we talked about, all divided by 45 kilograms. So newtons divided by kilograms get meters per second square. The calculator gives the answer 0 0.720. So the acceleration, if the force is maintained, is 0 0.720 meters per second to the right. So hopefully you can see how we deal with static friction when the body's not moving versus kinetic friction when the body is moving.